What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Lakers Outsiders podcast. I am Gary Kester with you as always. I am joined by two guests today. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, the Robin to my Batman, the Pal Gasol to my Kobe, or whatever you want to say. Hani yeah. Amadian is back with us. <laughs> Hani, how's it going, man? Uh, I am doing fine. Um, I think you missed the most important analogy to Alex Cruiser to your LeBron. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you're not supposed to be better than me. You're just supposed oh, to be a nice well, complimentary so, so, piece. So, yeah, you're right. You're right. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was good. Those two mixed up. It's okay. <laughs> Honest mistake. <laughs> also joining us is Kyle Hartwick. Kyle, I don't, I can't really think of an analogy on the spot. You got one? Because uh, um, Lamar Odom is reserved for Jacob. So I'm trying to think of, you could be. I'm like Derek Fisher, but not an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that so yeah. that is on the the podcast as well today <laughs> kyle how's it going man uh it's going well it's uh nice to see my son prospering in the playoffs right now uh the nets are down a game but we'll get there we have our uh, obligatory d'angelo russell <laughs> mention on the, this podcast I'm, just, I'm still stuck on the Derek fisher thing because i'm not married but i kind of feel the need to protect my wife <laughs> <laughs> which one that's what <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh this pod is off to a beautiful start <laughs> All right, well, if you love uh, analogies or wife stealing or whatever <laughs> we're going to dive into on this podcast, as always, you can find the Lakers Outsiders podcast on iTunes, on Podbean, on YouTube, and hopefully soon you'll be able to find it on Spotify. Still working on that. I apologize. I'm working as fast as I can. Um, and as always, uh, if you like the pod, you can always subscribe and you can leave us reviews on iTunes. And actually, we are always accepting questions to the podcast via iTunes review. So if you leave your question in an iTunes review, we will it will absolutely get answered on uh, the podcast. We actually have one that is related to our topic today, which is the Lakers coaching search. Uh, this is the first podcast we've done since the Lakers and Luke Walton parted ways. And Luke Walton is now with the Sacramento Kings. Uh, looks really weird. I mean, he's still in purple, but he looks really weird in Sacramento Kings gear. Um, which is funny because, like, we saw him in with the Cavaliers. And did he yeah. play with anybody else? He was in a soap opera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he never looked better so, than when he was in the soap You would think the whole opera. Kings thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> So I don't know what's going on, but, but yeah, that's what we'll start with today. Luke Walton, no longer the coach of the Lakers, lasted three seasons with the Lakers, uh, all of Brandon Ingram's career so far. And uh, that's about the only player I think that was there for the entire uh, entire length of his his tenure at um, or with the Lakers. But Kyle, I'll throw it to you first. Uh, how did you feel about about Luke this year? It was kind of a kind of weird circumstances with him and. Um, you know, he was kind of a polarizing figure. I think you had kind of, uh, a half and half people that thought, you know, it wasn't really his fault. And a lot of people that thought he was terrible and needed to go where on that topic, did you kind of, kind of sit and how did you feel when he was let go? I was very kind of apathetic towards Luke the entire year. I felt that, you know, he showed promise at times with his defensive schemes, uh, he obviously had good connections with LeBron, with the young get kids. Um, he he was always really good in interviews and stuff like that. Uh, the, the problem was he showed that he was not willing to change his ways to help the team by hiring any sort of viable coaching staff, mm-hmm. as well as uh, you know change, changing up his offensive schemes a little bit because that's where we the Lakers really struggled this year. Um, so near the end, I was, I was just really apathetic. I I didn't really care whether we kept him. I would have been happy if we let him go as we did. I was okay with it and understanding of it. Uh, I think that the real dagger for me was when it leaked that he was unwilling to change his coaching staff at all, because that was a very clearing issue that he's always had is he hasn't had 
assistants around him that are beneficial. It's just kind of his buddies, his volleyball buds. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wish him all the best in Sacramento. And I think he's going to be a good coach someday, but I don't think he was the right coach for this LeBron Lakers team. Honey, did you see any kind of similarities with Luke Walton's situation and what David Blatt went through? I mean, when you kind of, th- I kind of thought about this um, when the season ended, but he basically took over a clearly full rebuilding situation, right? Where the Lakers were just bottoming out. They were very young and it was, we all knew it was going to take a few years. And then it was like this, or this past summer last year, it was like, bam, they got LeBron. So that changes a lot. And that was kind of the same thing David Blatt went through with the Cavs. He took over a rebuilding team. They had Kyrie Irving in place, but uh, getting LeBron kind of changed everything. Cause then they got Kevin Love with, with him as well. And, and kind of change things. I mean, do you see some similarities in that in that situation? I think the situation is similar uh, just in how you describe it, about how, you know, when you get LeBron, the whole dynamic of your organization, the whole timeline of it just completely changes, and everything is centered about, uh, about LeBron, which it should be. Uh, there's a reason why he's the best player in the world, and, you know, when you have that caliber of a player, you have to – uh, basically adhere to his needs and, and get the right coach for him. Um, I will say, though, the, the Blatt, Blatt and Luke kind of had the opposite, uh, to me, like, abilities. Uh, Blatt was known as a really good strategic coach, um, scheming. His offenses were really uh, modern and and uh, well-respected, while Luke was the opposite. And Blatt just never seemed to have the sort of personality to get along with NBA players and to get along with NBA media, um, which I think kind of led to him and, and LeBron more publicly clashing heads. Like, uh, I, I believe it was, uh, I don't remember when it was, but LeBron basically telling him that he wasn't going to run his play at one point towards the end of a game, um, and him saying that publicly, that that's what happened. Um, that sort of thing didn't happen with Luke, who I don't think had a great relationship with LeBron. Uh, they didn't, but publicly they were okay with each other, and I don't think they clashed as much. Um, so I would say that that was different, but their situations, the environment around them was pretty similar. You're right. It was like having that, to me, it seemed like having that coworker that you're like, you can tolerate during the work week, but when they invite you out to happy hour, you're like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't need to see you outside of the 40 hours that I already see you at work. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I I felt kind of bad for Luke. I mean, I do agree with Kyle. I think it was kind of time to move on. And I don't know. I mean, I thought his biggest – there were two, I mean, two glaring weaknesses with Luke. How he handled the rotation, I think, a lot of times was very poorly done, especially when we would, you know, see – some terrible lineups to start the fourth quarters of games, especially close games. And I think it cost them a number of games over the course of the three years that he was here. And just, just botching that whole situation and, and, you know, not staggering lineups, right. That was kind of the big thing. And we only saw, I think it was 23 games this year that Brandon Ingram, Lonzo ball and LeBron James were all in the lineup. But even when one was out, let's say they had Ingram Kuzma and LeBron, there were times where all three were sitting on the bench and it's like, you, you can't do that. I mean, you've got to have one of them out there, especially in a playoff push. Like they were, I mean, after the all-star break, it was basically, they were in playoff mode already. Like every game was so crucial and just the way he handled the rotation was obviously very frustrating. The offensive schemes, certainly left more to be desired, but defensively, I think he deserves a lot of credit and he doesn't get a lot of credit for, and honey, you can expand on this because I know you've kind of talked about this on, um, in different pieces and on Twitter and, but defensively, I mean, I think he overcame a lot with this, with the Laker groups that he's had, because frankly, I mean, before he got here, their defensive teams were awful. Yeah. And having, I mean, the corpse of Kobe certainly didn't help that uh, because he just couldn't move the way he used to be able to. But I mean, it was, I don't, I don't want to say he like changed the culture, but like defensively it was a total, it was a total change in, in philosophy with that. 
Yeah, I mean, even his, I, I actually looked this up today because I was curious. Um, his first year coaching the Lakers, they were the worst team in the league defensively, like bottom, bottom team. And the last two years, uh, both years, they've been 13th uh, in defensive rating. And I think that growth from year one to year two, and then being able to uh, sustain, that, sustain that this year, um, even surpass it for most of the season until all the injuries hit, but still being able to keep a defense that's, you know, in the top half of the league, while not really having players that you would consider really good defenders. Um, like, let's say this year, he had Lonzo and Brandon Ingram, who were pretty solid, um, had their fair share of mistakes because they're young, but that's about it uh, on the perimeter. And then JaVale McGee playing really well for parts of the year and playing really poorly for other parts of the year. Last year, he made Julius Randle a legitimate rim protector as a small ball five, which was something mm -hmm. that nobody considered even remotely possible when Randle got drafted or for his first couple years in the league. Except I for think... me, because he's my child. And I think <laughs> he can do anything. Listen, man, those T-Rex arms all of a sudden became... Uh, uh... Hey, <laughs> we don't talk about that on this podcast. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's very clear that, that Luke has... Uh, a talent for being able to scheme really good defenses. Um, we've seen him be creative at times this year, like with how they guarded Draymond Green on that Christmas Day uh, when um, he is willing to take risks. He's willing to put his players in positions to defend really well and challenge them to do things that, you know, uh, we might not think they're, they would be good at, but because he sees them in practice and, and kind of, challenges them and, and kind of empowers them to do it, it ends up actually working a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to, to have this group finish, uh, I think it was tied for 12th because I remember looking it up. But 12th or 13th in defensive efficiency when you have LeBron, who obviously doesn't you know want to play defense like he, he did in his prime, uh, like with Miami, for example. So with LeBron, Rondo, who is just – God awful on 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 defense. Guys like Lance Stevenson, and you know you can go down the list. This Laker team was not built to play defense, and they were an above average team defensively. I think, like I said, I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, offensively, I mean the schemes aren't great. It was a lot of simple stuff, which I think works just fine in the playoffs. I think you see that in the playoffs a lot. Uh, teams kind of simplify things. Um, it's a lot more half court stuff. So maybe if they would have gotten in the playoffs, it would have been a little bit better, but yeah, offensively it wasn't great, but I think it's, it's a little unfair to really give Luke a full grade this year, because like we said, their three best players played in literally a quarter of the season together. Um, Lonzo missed half the year. 20 and Ingram missed time. And, it was, I mean, they were just so snake bitten that it's just really hard to really, you know, judge their full performance. But again, I, I do think it was time to move on. And, um, you know, it's both nerve wracking and exciting to kind of see where the team goes next. And we wish, I think we all agree that we wish Luke the best um, in Sacramento. I think, I think Luke's a good dude. And, you know, was a was a good ambassador for the Lakers, and he. Uh, I mean, I I think he I think he's a guy that works really hard, and I think the Kings are gonna like him. I think they're gonna uh, hate some of his you know <laughs> glaring flaws, but um, I think he's a guy that works hard and and truly wants to to win as a coach and and to to really lead a group. And I think he's a good coach for for young players. So wish him the best in uh, Sacramento. So. Uh, anything else you guys want to touch on uh, with Luke before we move on to the current coaching search? What what I really want to know is if he is taking those hitmen that he talked about when, when the Lakers got in a fight. I don't know if he's taking them with him to Sacramento or if they're staying in town. <laughs> somebody was like, I saw somebody say that that was their favorite Luke moment. I was like, it was like to me, that's number two. Number one for me was when LeVar, was, LeVar Ball was talking a bunch of – smack to like tmz or some something that luke was like a terrible coach and so like lonzo was like benched in like the fourth quarter or came off the bench or something and he was asked about it he was like yeah his dad was talking shit so I <laughs> <on the> bench. <laughs> like that's like that stuff i'll miss about luke luke is very i feel like he's he's so calm and collected but he's also very charismatic 
Yeah. Um, so I think I'll definitely miss that about him, but I will not miss the volleyball bros. <laughs> so <laughs> squad goals, <laughs> squad goals. Hey, summer's coming up boys. It's going to be the Lakers outsiders <laughs> beach volleyball team against Luke and the Arizona crew. So the Kings coaching Ash. staff. Hashtag squad goals Instagram post. <laughs> Just the Lakers coaching staff. I'm ready. All righty. Well, we wish Luke Walton the best, but it is time to move on to the next coach um, of the Los Angeles Lakers. And so far, Rob Palenka is what we think. I mean, what it sounds like running the show by himself and running this coaching search by himself and so far we've heard of three coaching names we'll start with the first one kyle teron lu is the first name that comes up and obviously laker fans should be familiar with him um alan iverson's very familiar with him <laughs> and lebron's <laughs> lebron's obviously familiar with him as lu you uh previously coached the Cav- cleveland cavaliers who overcame a 3-1 series deficit in the nba finals against uh the 73 and 9 golden state warriors who had the first ever unanimous mvp people forget that (laughs) (laughs) nobody ever talks about that (laughs) yeah um but yeah teron lu uh two-time nba champion as a player with the lakers and then one time champ as a coach uh with the Cavs, got them helped get them their only nba championship uh kyle what I mean, what are your thoughts on Teron Liu as a coach, and how do you think he would fit with this group uh, particularly? Well, it's it's hard exactly to say how Ty Liu would fit with the Lakers because the Lakers, as I see it right now, are kind of uh, in purgatory, right? Like, they have so many guys who are coming off of the books that they probably aren't going to re-sign. Like, I wouldn't imagine they would re-sign Lance Stevens and John Rondo. Those guys are at least, I would hope, Knock on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, basically it's who is the best coach for LeBron James, right? Maybe mm-hmm. a couple of the young pieces will hopefully be there if this group gets what we want, right? There are some people who are screaming for Anthony Davis, and that's fine too. Anthony Davis is a great player. Um, but really, we have kind of a unique opportunity to not have a coach come in and have to build his scheme around a team he can build his team around his scheme right like we can go out and whatever whoever the coach is sign guys that fits that so i don't think the scheme really matters for Ty Lue right now i think it's more about the relationship with the most prominent player which is obviously alex caruso we need somebody who is going to be <laughs> no coach can handle alex caruso <laughs> It seemed it seemed like Ty Lue and LeBron James had a really good relationship in Cleveland. I don't think that Ty Lue was the reason that LeBron James left Cleveland. Uh, nobody thinks that, right? Uh, uh, his name wouldn't even be mentioned if it were. Um, so it makes sense on that front. Um, I think his Lakers ties also help him. I can't tell you the last time we, the Lakers hired a coach that wasn't you know connected to the team in some way. Uh, previously I hired anybody <laughs> yeah yeah uh so th- so that's obviously important there um and could sway it what worries me most is that rob Polinka is leading the search because i want him gone personally um so i i, I don't know ty tyloo could be a great fit for the lakers but it's hard to really say what the lakers are right now aside from lebron and james and we obviously know that tyloo and lebron are a good fit one thing I'll say about Ty Lue, and I'll throw this over to me to add on to him. I think it's pretty fair to call him a player's coach because it seemed like the Cavs players responded much better to him than they did with David Blatt, even though schematically they might have taken a step back, but it seemed like he was kind of a better motivator. Am I off base on that? Would you agree with that? Or No, that sounds pretty right to me. Wow, we agree on something. <laughs> Amazing. That's obviously not a college football or basketball season. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, I mean, as much as we're going to talk about the head coaches and the coaching candidates, honey, it's obviously 
I mean, we talk, just talked about it with Luke Walton. It's who they fill out their staff with. It's also going to be very important, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, there are very few coaches where you give them full reign and they will do everything correctly. There are legitimate Spurs fans that uh, take issue with uh, Greg Popovich's decision making as well. No coach is going to be perfect. So um, filling out your staff with really good assistant coaches that can help, you know, uh, fix up any flaws that your head coach might have is really important. And for the Lakers who are sitting on a crap load of money because they play in Los Angeles, have a giant TV deal are one of the top two or two or three most valuable franchises in the league. Um, they should be spending as much money as possible getting those guys that are not, you know, cash strapped by a cap space or, uh, you know, a max, max amount of salary that you can give them. Um, so yeah, with Ty Lu, who, again, I, I don't think, I think he gets a little bit underrated in terms of his actual coaching ability. Like the Cavaliers had incredible offenses with, with him leading them. Um, how much of that is LeBron and, and the other you know, really talented players that he had with Kyrie and Kevin Love and how much of it is his coaching who really knows, but I, you know, I think it's safe to say that he has an impact on that. Um, but again, his most important attribute is the fact that he and LeBron are really close. And to me, um, probably the most important thing that comes out of this coaching search is that relationship. It's got to be somebody that LeBron mm-hmm. respects a lot and, and will, you know, get challenged by that coach and respond to it rather than, you know, uh, do some of the things that he got criticized for this year, like not playing enough defense or the poor body language or whatever, what, what have you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's been stories about that, that, you know, Lou is a guy that will call out LeBron, is not mm-hmm. afraid to kind of go at him and, and let him know, like, hey, you're, you know, you're slacking on defense or your body language sucks, like you mentioned. And I think that's important. And obviously, I think LeBron signed off on, you know, the Lakers interviewing him or, you know, even pursuing him at all, because if their relationship was a strained relationship, the Lakers wouldn't even reach out to him, you know, so. um yeah, Lou is an interesting, an interesting uh, candidate because of his ties to the Lakers, because the Lakers love that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, when you have a relationship, a good relationship with with LeBron James, that's obviously very, very important because he's going to be the centerpiece to this franchise for at least the next two seasons. So that's, I mean, that's obviously important. But like like we said you know, filling out the coaching staff is going to be so key and being able, because I mean, it could also, it could also uh, always change, but the coach that's going to come in has to manage LeBron and develop young players. So that's, I mean, it's a pretty all to do both of them. So yeah. Brandon Ingram, Lonzo Ball, Kyle Kuzma, Josh Hart. Um, you don't need to develop Alex Caruso because he's already the perfect player, but <laughs> Just doing both of those things is going to be very, very difficult. So, uh, but I think Lou is is a good candidate to do that because he obviously has the LeBron um, situation down. Uh, it would just kind of depend on his staff and get some good player development guys. And I think it'd be a pretty good staff. So, all right. The next candidate we're going to talk about is Monty Williams, who is an assistant coach with the Philadelphia 76ers right now, uh, which is kind of tricky for the Lakers because the Sixers are in a playoff series against the Brooklyn Nets against Kyle's son. Um, (laughs) So Kyle might not be a fan of his right now, but uh, there's also an obvious connection with Monty Williams with Anthony Davis because he coached him in New Orleans with the, with the Pelicans. Uh, He was there for five seasons. They made the first round or made the playoffs and got beat in the first round two times. Um, Interesting candidate. I think he's, the guy's been through a lot um, in his life, like um, especially just in recent years. Um, So it's good to see him back in coaching and getting head coaching uh, consideration. But Kyle, what are your thoughts on, on Monty Williams? I mean, do you think he's a legit candidate or do you think this is kind of due diligence and how much do you think the Anthony Davis connection plays a role on this? Uh, one, personally, I think he's a legit candidate. He might not be a legit candidate for the Lakers, who would probably prefer somebody with Lakers connections just based off of history, right? 
Uh, but if he, I, if he grew up a Laker fan, that might be enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna Google where he was born. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it absolutely is due diligence as well, right? Like he is one of the top available candidates for any coaching search, in my opinion. Um, he has obviously had a lot happen in his personal life in recent years. Um, but from what I've heard in interviews that he's had with like Woj and other uh, podcasters, uh, is that he's itching to get back. Uh, he has been for a while now, and he said at times it was hard for him to stay away. Um, mm -hmm. So the Lakers would be a good opportunity. He obviously gets to coach one of the best players in the world, potentially could coach another great player in Anthony Davis, or if the Lakers sign somebody in free agency, obviously that's the plan. Uh, that's a really enticing coaching job for a lot of people right now. And I think the job could be his if he wanted it, but it, again, depends on how much of a Lakers fan he was growing up. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, he he's obviously um, a, a good candidate for the job, and I I would personally be okay with him getting hired. But then again, I do not run the Lakers, so we'll just have to wait and see on that one. Yeah, only one man is allowed to run the Lakers right now. <laughs> not Palinka. Honey, what are your thoughts on Monty Williams? So I think Monty is uh, a little bit lower on the list in terms of schematics. Um, I don't think he's necessarily a, a great X's and O's coach. But where he is really great is that he is beloved by literally everybody in the NBA. He seems to be the epitome of a player's coach. Um, you know, Anthony Davis has talked about how much he loved playing for him. Um, Kevin Durant has talked about how much play, uh, he loved playing a lot, uh, for him as an assistant coach in OKC. Um, again, those connections, he uh, has coached LeBron with Team USA. He's coached Anthony Davis. He's coached Kevin Durant. Um, he's also been in the Spurs front office, so he might have a little bit of a connection with Kawhi Le Leonard. I don't know how much of that is true or not, but um, he's, he's at least been around that organization and that environment, which is you know basically what every team in the NBA is trying to get to. Um, to me, like if I'm comparing Lou and, and, and Monty, I prefer uh, Teron Lou. But I definitely would not be upset by Monty Williams at all. I think he um, he's experienced, which I think is something that the Lakers are going to move towards with this coaching uh, search. I think I think they would rather have somebody who's experienced, um, coached a lot, and, and been in the playoffs. Um, and he fits that to a T. Yeah, I think he's a I think he's a decent candidate. I think I mean for the reasons that you guys mentioned, I won't expand too much further on it, but. Yeah, I mean, I think being a player's coach and having guys buy into what you're what you're selling and you know what you believe um, believe in ph philosophically as a coach, I think is very important. And I think with both the guys that we've talked about so far, with Lou and 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 Williams, that you know they're both able to do that, and that's very important. Especially, I mean, I think it's a little it's probably something that's a little easier to do at like the college level with like mm -hmm. younger players, um, but in the NBA, I mean, you're, you're dealing with with grown men and uh, to get them to to consistently buy in, I think is very important, and I think Monty Williams definitely has that characteristic as a coach, and I think that's very important. And like you said, Honey, he is so well liked around the league. I think yeah. that's that would be a great like <laughs> counteract to uh, Rob Palinka, who <laughs> appears to not be liked by anybody around the league. So, I mean, I guess it would kind of balance out at that point, but. Opposing Who, GMs are going to start calling for the trades and be like, "Hey, put Monty on the." <laughs> but hey, put yeah, get Monty or uh, LeBron on the phone, please. Because oh god, I don't even want to think about LeBron negotiating trades. <laughs> Anthony Davis, I'll give you every draft pick ever. I'll throw in three uh, Larry O'Brien trophies. I mean, he already traded. What was it? it was uh, who was it? Somebody for Ben Simmons in the All-Star draft. I think it was Russ. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gave up Russ for Ben Simmons. <laughs> we'll see how that plays out. <laughs> oh, boy. But, yeah, I think I think Monty's a, a good candidate. Um, I don't think he's the best candidate out there, but he's a good candidate. I mean, I think it's, it's another promising name 
uh, yeah. to, to go out there. It, it's, it's a lot better than reaching out to, you know, some of the old timers like Mark Jackson or Jason Kidd. Um, and there are, there are fans that like both of those guys. Um, I mean, there's, st- I've learned <laughs> through my days on Twitter now that there are stands for literally everyone. And those two are no exception. I don't really get it because it's like, you look at what the bucks are doing right now. Um, it's like Jason Kidd didn't get even close to that <laughs> with this group. Yeah. And as soon as he left, they took off and the warriors kind of did the same thing. As soon as Mark Jackson left, they went from being a six seed and back to back years to being one of the greatest teams ever. <laughs> so In the regular season, <laughs> <laughs> they did blow a three, one lead in the NBA finals. Forget that. <laughs> um, but yeah. And then, I mean, with Mark Jackson, I mean, this is kind of going a little bit off topic, but you know, I, I think he deserves some credit for kind of helping develop the warriors. Cause when he took that job, they were terrible. I think they drafted really well, which obviously helped things, but um, he deserves a little credit. But at the same time, you know, he left a front office or he was basically fired because he (laughs) had a front office that hated him. Like he just, I mean, he botched that whole situation so poorly. Yeah. I mean, so bad. You look at any story from uh, that time and it just, it, it was literally the worst possible work environment his assistant coaches did not trust him they recorded their meetings with him his uh he made festus Azili cry because he uh had a knee injury or something and couldn't play and i guess mark jackson accused him of like lying about it or something uh yeah i don't like i don't like jason kidd and jason kidd is a bad coach and i would take Jason Kidd in a heartbeat over Mark Jackson. That's how much (laughs) he just does not make sense. Assistance recording conversations. This comes on the day that there's the report of the Raiders sending all their scouts home (laughs) because they can't trust them. What is going on with, with the Bay area and not being able to trust (laughs) assistance? Uh, Yeah. I don't know. Still jealous of their current basketball team though. And they should let Kevin Durant sign with the Lakers, but that's beside the point. <laughs> We're talking coaches here. <laughs> um, all right. So we've talked about Teron Lou. We've talked about Monty Williams. Let's talk about the third name on the list that we've, that has surfaced so far. Um, there's also been a lot of buzz that the Lakers are going to continue to add names to this list, which is very encouraging because they have plenty of time to complete this coaching search and you want to see them do a thorough coaching search. So good job, Rob Palinka. You haven't screwed it up yet. I'm proud of you. (laughs) But the third name on the list is Juwan Howard, who is a former teammate of LeBron James and has been with uh, the Miami Heat for for a while now. Uh, At least um, on them, and I think he's had a couple different roles, but um, he's a very promising kind of up and coming candidate as a coach and he has that tie with LeBron James, which is very important. And I think, uh, Kyle, another layer here that I think is very important is that I don't know how good his or how strong his relationship is with Rob Palenka, but they do have ties because they were teammates together back um, at Michigan uh, playing basketball there. So, I mean, do you think having the connection to LeBron and Palenka kind of in a way makes Juwan Howard kind of the favorite to, to land this job? It helps. And he is probably second on my list of candidates, believe it or not. Um, Mostly due to his current boss, Eric Spolstra, who is, I think, my favorite coach in the NBA. I've just always liked what he's done and what that Heat team has done uh, with their assistants. They kind of treat them like family. And when somebody leaves, it's because they earned it and because they felt like they're moving to a better position where they're not going to get canned in a year or two, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for David Fisdale, that didn't work out because of the Grizzlies. But uh, I I think having relationships with Palenka and uh, LeBron definitely helps. I didn't know he had a relationship with Palenka until right now, as you said it. So that's (laughs) kind of cool. Um, But the one thing that we can't really determine is offensive and defensive schemes with Howard's. We have, we have no idea. 
Mm. He hasn't previously coached anywhere. We can kind of look at Spolstra, but Spolstra has been doing his own thing for a lot longer than Howard's been there. Um, yeah. But uh, Howard is just a really good guy too, right? Like he, um, I, I remember seeing that he has been like a charitable guy for a very long time, mm. um, both in Miami and then in Chicago, I think. He worked with CPS for a while, um, not directly as a teacher or anything, but worked with programs and stuff like that. Right, right. Um, the one thing that's holding me up, though, is isn't he kind of just Luke Walton, but three years earlier? Like a, a guy that we need to, you know, that needs chances and needs time to learn, which we don't have that time with LeBron James getting older every day. You know, it. it it, it, that's probably the one downside for Howard with me is that he's going to need a lot of time to learn. And I don't think the Lakers have the time to let him experiment. Yeah. That's kind of the thing with, I mean, a, hiring a coach that doesn't have any head coaching experience is that you'd never really know what you're going to get. You know, I think a lot of people when Luke was um, with Luke Walton was hired with the Lakers, obviously he was, I mean, really he was kind of the the hottest, like young up and coming candidate on the market. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of people thought, Oh, we're going to get basically younger Steve Kerr because <laughs> he's been his assistant coach. And I think that, I mean, we've learned over the past few years that just cause you're hiring a coach, an assistant coach from, you know, a, a prominent coach's staff, you're not necessarily getting a different version of that head coach, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, yeah, I mean it's it's a little it's a little scary, I guess, especially because this is I mean, honey, this is a really important hire. Like this is one. I mean, because since Phil's gone or Phil left, uh, retired in two thousand, Phil Jackson two thousand eleven, um, there's been so much coaching turnover. So the pressure, you know, to get this hire done correctly is is very high. And do you think? Or, I mean, how how would you feel if they went with Jawan Howard? And I mean, do you think he would fit in with this with this team? And how do you think he would handle those expectations coming in? I think the thing that makes Jawan Howard uh, a promising candidate is the thing that the Lakers need but shouldn't be their priority. So, in doing some research on, you know, what he's been doing with Miami over the past six years or so. Um, it seems like most of what Jawan Howard gets credit, credited for is his player development. Um, and you can see in their young players that that has that he's done a lot of good work. Uh, they've had Justice so, Winslow basically turn into a point forward. Yeah, what's Brandon up? Ingram would become Kevin Durant. Is what yeah, you're saying. Ex exactly. <laughs> and and Lonzo Ball would turn into Alex Caruso. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he's uh, you know that the Heat have been able to turn Justice Winslow, who was previously an awful offensive player, um, based on his shooting, into like a legitimate point forward, and he's really excelled in that role. Um, they've turned Josh Richardson, who was a very unheralded prospect, into one of the best three and D players in the league. Um, Bam Adebayo looks like he he should be taking over their starting center spot over Hassan Whiteside. Um, so, you know, based on kind of the evidence of that and and what those players have said about Jawan Howard, I think it's very clear that he is very good in that role. But like you guys mentioned, um, that isn't priority number one with the Lakers. It should be a priority because, you know, most of their team is still these young players that they're invested in. Um, but the number one thing is, hey, you have LeBron James for three more years. And it's pretty embarrassing if you do not make deep runs into the playoffs. And it's probably, honestly, you know, with LeBron standards and the Lakers standards, it's probably a failure if you don't win a championship without him, with him. Um, and I, you know, you never know until it happens whether the, the coach that has no experience is one that you can win a championship with. Ty Lue didn't have any head coaching experience and they did it. But um, it's also a risk that I don't think is very likely the Lakers will take. Yeah, it's. I think it's high risk, high reward. Where if he really, if he really sticks, um, he could be the head coach for a very long time, and mm -hmm. that'd be nice to see because it feels like the Lakers haven't had that in a in a long time. So, um, yeah, it's like I said, high risk, high reward. But 
I I would tend to agree with you, honey. I think I just can't see them rolling those dice, especially because I feel like although Polinka seems to be very well liked in the or by the right people in the front office, I feel like if he messes up the coaching hire, that's going to be a very poor reflection on him. Um, yeah. So. I guess um, I mean Lou has played for the Lakers, but if they're like a a picture, there's a picture that surfaces of Monty Williams or Jawan Howard in like a Laker <laughs> shirt. I think they immediately get on Teron Lou's level, who I think is probably the leading candidate um, because of his tie with LeBron James. But there's going to be a story that Monty Williams grew up a Kobe fan, even though that timeline doesn't match at all. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, everybody grew up a Kobe fan, man. <laughs> Will Chamberlain grew up a Kobe fan. But uh, no, um, those are the three names that have surfaced so far. Um, hopefully, we see a lot of a lot of. I mean, I'd like to see a lot of names come out. Like, I want to see a really extensive search um, and really figure out like who is going to be the best candidate to to run this team. So so far, it just seems like um, uh, Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN reported basically that they've kind of met or Palinka has met with these coaching candidates and it's been kind of like a meet and greet kind of getting to know the candidates and they're going to meet with, it sounds like they're going to meet with each candidate um, another, at least another or a second time. Um, and Jeannie Buss might be in attendance uh, for those meetings and they'll, they'll go over kind of specifics of, of the job and, and all your typical job interview questions, I'm sure. <laughs> So you see yourself in five years. <laughs> <laughs> Coaching the Clippers. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's it for the uh, candidates that we know of that are linked to the job. Um, like I said, that list is going to expand and we'll certainly be around to talk about it when it does. Um, so definitely uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, we're going to end on this topic. This was actually brought in uh, via iTunes review. Um, like I said, at the start of the show, if you want your questions uh, answered on the podcast. If you leave it in an iTunes review, it will 100% guaranteed get answered on one of our our podcasts. Um, and this question um, was left for us, which was good timing because we were talking about the the whole coaching situation. But um, we were asked, um, I would like to know who you guys think would be the best fit at head coach uh, since the change has been made. Um, asked about Mark Jackson. Um, which we already discussed, also asked about the Van Gundy brothers um, and Ty Lue. Um, so basically it com- comes down to um, who do you guys think would be the best fit at head coach? It doesn't have to be a candidate that we just talked about or we've we've listed. Uh, Kyle, I'll throw it to you first. Who would be, I guess, I mean, this is also a total shot in the dark because we don't get to interview these candidates and whatnot, but who would be your choice to, to fill this job? Uh Tyloo, uh, mostly because of reasons I've already kind of stated. He has a relationship with LeBron, which is key. Um, he has head coaching experience. He, we're not taking a complete shot in the dark with an assistant, so we know what we're getting into. And he has Lakers ties, which doesn't really matter to me personally, but it certainly matters to mom, uh, Jeannie Bus, <laughs> And... Uh, <laughs> 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 and Rob pulling. Uh, I don't think it matters to Rob, but Rob takes orders from the boss. Uh, so he, he's probably so. the best. He's probably the best coaching candidate out there. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of stumbling through this because Hani's reaction was beautiful. But <laughs> <laughs> I guess if Jeannie busts his mom, then D'Angelo Russell is her grandson. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out later. But uh yeah T- Tyloo, he has head coaching experience which is obviously really important when you're trying to like he, gary said win a championship with lebron james in the next three years otherwise it is a failure it absolutely is it's also a failure if you don't get a, a star in free agency this year right like there are so many causes for failure along this uh lakers timeline over the next three or four years that they can't avoid or they can't afford to make a mistake and take a shot on an assistant, which is, it obviously rules out 
uh, Howard, and then Williams, I just think, is a shade below Lou, like Hanley said earlier. So Lou is definitely my choice for who I'd like to see the, the Lakers get. Hani, who's your choice? Um, you can't say uh, Eric Musselman. <laughs> I, that that wound is still open. Please, please don't rub salt in it. So uh, you also can't say Steve Alford. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> think I would. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, my answer, my real answer is also Ty Lue. Um, and the biggest reason being what I mentioned before that um, I think the most important thing out of this coaching search is finding somebody that has LeBron's full respect and trust. Um, but I do want to throw out a name out there. Um, Darvin Ham, who has been like very minorly uh, mentioned as somebody that the Lakers could go after, but there haven't been any concrete reports about it. Um, former NBA player, which I think is uh, kind of important in building that trust with, with LeBron. And he is right now the lead assistant on the Milwaukee Bucks, who uh, look like the favorites to make it to the finals out of the East. Um, he's been with Coach Bud uh, through his Atlanta years, uh, came came to Milwaukee from there. Um, he also has kind of the player development role. That's what he had in Atlanta, and now he's uh, higher up on the bench And he Milwaukee. was an assistant with the Lakers, so he that's has true. the Laker tie. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's the, obviously the most important part. Um, <laughs> and like we mentioned with Jawan Howard, it is a little risky that he's an assistant coach uh, and hasn't had any head coaching experience. But I do think he has he's had a much longer career as an assistant coach. He kind of comes from the uh, pop tree via uh, Coach Bud. Um, and I think he he's an interesting guy that, you know, I if I were the Lakers, if I were mom, I would be uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would I, I would at least throw out some feelers and, and get an interview and, and see what comes out of it. I'm not referring to Jeannie Buss's mom. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not doing this. um there are a lot of candidates i'd like the lakers to take a look at um from a schematic standpoint there there are a lot of guys uh steve clifford is actually one i would i mean he used to be a a laker assistant coach as well um the hornets probably aren't going to let him go uh, because um or hornets no with the magic now was with the hornets now with the magic um, and the Magic are in the playoffs. So, obviously, I think, you know, he does a good job. I think schematically he does a really good job, too, watching their games. And they beat the Lakers twice this year. They're kind of a pain. But, um, yeah, I think he's he's a guy um, that would be a good candidate. You could also pluck from, I think, uh, the Spurs coaching staff. I think they've got really three uh, potential candidates. Uh, Becky Hammond um, is – you know, a, a pretty popular name, and I think that would be kind of a groundbreaking hire, and I think it'd be awesome to see. Um, you know, I think I think she's a very bright basketball mind. Just kind of everything I've read on her, and uh, obviously with you know, she's I mean she's been around the game of basketball for a very long time, and she's a very prominent figure in the game of basketball. Her Lakers uh, connection is Pau Gasol writing the Players Tribune article about her. I'm, I'm yeah. just f- figuring things out <laughs> as we go along. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, Yudoka is another potential, potential name. Uh, Tori Messina has been a guy that seems to get linked to the Lakers job about, I think every time it, uh, opens up, but nothing ever really happens. Um, I think they interviewed him. Um, I think Mitch Kupchak interviewed him or at least there was talk that it was going to, but I want I want a good X's and O's coach personally because I think that would solve a lot of a lot of issues and it would teach I mean it would just teach guys how to play a better brand of basketball and I think that would be tremendous for the young players and not having them run just high pick and rolls or you know run isolation basketball if we get you know bogged down into to half court offense and um, very basic stuff stuff like that um, you could also pluck from the coaching ranks I think. Jay Wright is another one who's done a terrific job with Villanova. Tony Bennett. I think if Tony Bennett was ever going to leave, it would be now uh, because Virginia finally got their championship and they're losing their top three players to the NBA um, yeah. unless and, unless any of them come back, which, I, I mean, DeAndre Hunter is not going to come back because he's probably a top seven pick at least. So there's a lot. There's a lot of names that you could go with. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I, I do kind of agree with you guys though. I think Ty Lu is, you probably get like the best of both worlds with, with that, with the whole LeBron connection, you keep, you keep your superstar happy. And if he fills out his staff appropriately, I think that could be rock solid. You know, I think you could get those player development guys in there to work with the young players and you could, um, get the guy that LeBron likes and everybody will be happy. So I don't care who it is as long as it's the right hire. That's, that's like where I'm at with everything with the Lakers is that I'm just tired of seeing all the turnover with the front office, the coaching staff, all that. And the players too, like let's just get the right people in and let's, let's get this thing going. You know, you got LeBron James, like it's, you can't waste time. It's time to get it going. So, all right. Uh, anything else, fellas, before we sign off? Um, I'm just very pleased that we found a new nickname to call Genie Bus on every <laughs> podcast from here on out. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, on a serious note, though, whoever the Lakers coach is, and when they get hired, they better get a good staff. Like, uh, that's going to be under uh, an intense spotlight. Like, yeah. let's say Lou gets the job. Like, there's nothing preventing him from going out and trying to steal, like, a Monty Williams anyways, right? Like, if Monty decides he'd rather stay an assistant, like, just throw all of the money at the top guys regardless. Don't bring in uh, your bartender and make him a scout <laughs> like Jim Busted or whoever it was. I think it was Jim Bus. Uh, hey, man, I know, trust my bartender's <laughs> uh, sports takes. He could be my scout any day. <laughs> Chaz is a Lakers legend, Kyle, please. (laughs) The Lakers are one of the more elite franchises in all of sports when it comes to brand recognition. And they obviously have a ton of money in this team. Act like it. Yeah, they get like $30 a week from me because I keep buying all their damn gear. Yeah. (laughs) Hire people who are going to make the team better. Not Don't hire people because connections right and that's it so i don't know it's just something that's frustrated me over the last few years seeing uh stuff like that happen with the lakers they literally have the most like desirable front office job in the whole nba open right now Mm -hmm. like being president of basketball operations for the lakers has to be like the top of the list, especially with the situation they have. And we talked about this a lot on the last pod. So if you want to hear about that, go listen to uh, the last pod with me and Hani talking about that. Uh, but uh, as far as the coaching gig too, I mean, a lot of coaches would line up for this this position. So they need mm-hmm. to take their time, do their due diligence, figure out the right candidate and get the, the, the right coach in here. So, all righty, that will do, do it for us today. This is the it's the Lakers boys. We've got so much we can talk about with them. every day. Um, yeah, every single every single day. But um, yeah, that's gonna do it for us. Um, like I mentioned at the start of the podcast, you can find the pod on iTunes, YouTube, and Podbean. And if you like the pod, subscribe to us on YouTube and on iTunes. And if you want questions answered on the podcast leave them in an itunes review for us Uh, that helps us out a lot we really really appreciate that and i personally guarantee that if you leave a question in an itunes review it will get answered um unless you're asking me if i'll ever call a genie bus mom (laughs) might not answer that question already typing it up right now So yeah, uh, leave those for us. Like I said, those those are very, very helpful for us and we greatly, greatly appreciate them. Um, as always, we appreciate you uh, listening and Hani and Kyle, I want to thank you guys for staying up late with me to talk about this and we'll have plenty more to talk about as the uh, spring and, and summer roll on. So that'll do it for us this time. Um, until next time, for Kyle Hartwick and Hani Amadi and this is Gary Kester signing off. Shout out mom. Thank you.